The golf links lie so near the mill that almost every day the laboring children can look out and see the men at play. Well, that is what Sarah Cleghorn, a 19th century Quaker pacifist and socialist, thought of capitalism. A 21st century scholar, Francis Fukuyama, on the other hand, claims that we may be approaching the, quote, end of history now that the combination of free market capitalism and liberal democracy is spreading so rapidly around the entire world. Well, who is right? Is capitalism good or bad? Is it necessary for democracy or opposed to democracy? Scholars and citizens disagree. Most scholars today, however, say that capitalism is necessary for democracy but not sufficient. How so? Well, first, what is capitalism? In the broadest sense, capitalism is an economic system based on three simple ideas. One, an individual human being's self-interest is a good thing. Two, private property is a good thing. And three, specialization of labor and free trade is a good thing. You know, it does get more complicated in the modern world, especially when it comes to artificial individuals called corporations. But these three basics still hold true today. So how did capitalism get started? In the broadest sense, the ideas behind capitalism are as old as the human race. Our prehistoric ancestors lived in caves and crude shelters and had to survive by hunting animals and gathering wild foods. They knew their survival depended on looking out for oneself as well as for one's fellow tribe members. In other words, they did have self-interest. The tools to do that, spears, bows and arrows, knives, as well as cave paintings, shelter materials, and fire, had to be produced and kept safe from other animals, especially from other human beings. In other words, they had private property. Now, private in their case was not necessarily individual private property, however. Land, for instance, was owned and fiercely defended by a tribe rather than an individual. And they learned that one human or one tribe could trade with another human or tribe so that all profited. The warrior got a better spear. The spear maker got a better cut of the mammoth. One tribe got beads and the other got baskets. In other words, they did have specialization of labor and they had free trade. And from these primitive beginnings, capitalism, in fact, all systems of economics evolved over the past 100,000 or more years. In hunter-gathering societies, this primitive kind of capitalism worked, but it did have severe limitations. It provided an often precarious economic base that enabled our ancestor to survive, but the environment of early people was full of danger and short of food, shelter, and pleasure. People needed more than economics to survive. Scholars who have studied early people have found that people then often had more leisure than people today. They used some of this leisure to create new meanings to see them through dark and dangerous nights. In other words, they created religion and the arts. And some of them used their leisure to invent better spears, bows and arrows, fire. In other words, they invented science and technology. Besides having more leisure than modern men and women, they also had more disease, more starvation, and more violence. In fact, the average man or woman in those perilous early times lived less than 30 years. 
Then about 10,000 years ago, some people in some parts of the world learned how to grow food and domesticate animals. And eventually this agricultural revolution spread to all the continents of Earth. Economically, the agricultural revolution was a mixed blessing. With a more reliable food supply, populations increased dramatically. There was now enough surplus wealth to allow a few people to escape the day-to-day -day struggle for existence and to specialize, to become kings and queens, priests, warriors, engineers, architects, bureaucrats, artists, storytellers, and to found the world's first cities and civilizations. It also led to new kinds of economic systems that featured strong class differences, tyrannical governments, bloody wars, and severe restrictions on freedom for almost everyone. Because agriculture and animal husbandry demand much more heavy labor than hunting and gathering, it not only cut back on leisure, it led to peasantry, serfdom, or slavery for most people. The strongest exploited the weakest, both within the tribal, ethnic, religious, or political group, and between tribal, ethnic, religious, and political groups. And most people lived a subsistence existence where bartering was common, but free trade and private property were severely limited. In ancient Rome, for example, text on agriculture recommended that a master would need at least 12 slaves to operate a small farm. Roman emperors, senators, philosophers, artists, writers, warriors, and assorted nobles like the Greek and Egyptian nobility before them got their wealth from rent on farmland worked by millions of slaves. With such widespread slave labor, they had little incentive to improve technology or economic organization. In China, India, Southeast Asia, Africa, North and South America, the picture was similar. The ruling elite laid heavy taxes on the peasants or simply enslaved them and used this agriculturally based wealth not to make more wealth, but to construct forts, castles, and palaces for the rulers and his or her followers. These forts, castles, and palaces were neither to defend the society's wealth as well as to wage aggressive war on nearby kingdoms in the effort to get more wealth, that is, land, animals, and slaves. Since wealth in all of these agricultural kingdoms was a more or less fixed quantity, one person or one group could only become wealthier by taking from another person or group. In other words, if I win, you lose. If you win, I lose. Net result, zero increase in total human wealth. Today we call that a zero-sum economy. But although there were many differences between them, some historians describe the economic foundations of these agricultural civilizations as feudalism. In feudal societies, there is always a strong class distinction between the elite rulers, typically less than 2% of the total population, and the working peasants, serfs, or slaves, typically over 98% of the population. As could be expected in these zero-sum economies, wars were extremely common. In the 17th century, for instance, there were over 50 major wars in Northern Europe alone. All of these feudal societies also nurtured and shaped religious beliefs and practices to help unify and justify their economic and political structures. Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, Confucianism, many varieties of polytheism, and later then the two great monotheistic religions, Christianity and Islam, grew from, supported, modified, and sometimes made these feudal civilizations more humane. For many thousands of years, this kind of mutual interdependence with class-defined obligations, religious zeal, zero-sum economies, frequent wars, and subsistence living was the norm 
in agriculturally based human societies. And this zero-sum mentality, along with its wars, poverty, class, and religious differences, was and is so powerful, it has lasted right up to the 21st century in many parts of the world. Fortunately, not in all. Just think about it for a minute. Consider the average person. For more than 100,000 years, the average human beings lived less than 30 years in almost daily fear of disease, starvation, or violent death. For more than 10,000 years past, the average human being still lived only slightly more than 30 years as a peasant, serf, or slave, could not read or write, saw most of their children die before the age of two, rarely traveled more than a few miles from their place of birth, and were still always and everywhere in fear of disease, starvation, or war. And then suddenly, suddenly, in historical terms, in the last 200 years, there has been a change, an enormous change, for people living in an industrial society today, that is. The average person today lives two or three times as long, over 70 years. He or she can read and write, travels thousands of miles a year, rarely see their children die, and are healthier, wealthier, freer than ever before in human history, and only rarely find themselves in daily fear of violence, starvation, and death. So how did it happen? Uh, that is a good question. And here scholars debate. History is not quite like science. There are no ways to conduct experiments that yield definitive answers. Nevertheless, most modern scholars think that the weight of evidence from the past supports the following story. What makes much of the modern world different is the combined power of science, technology, capitalism, and democracy. Instead of zero-sum economies, we now have, in many parts of the world, not all, win-win economics, based and driven not by serf or slave labor, but by the creativity and innovation of free labor, free markets, and free trade, by what we call modern capitalism. Well, here we must go back and qualify a little what was said before. Past agricultural societies were not totally zero-sum. In all agricultural societies, there was some progress, even if slow and halting. All human societies, for instance, including hunting-gathering ones, have engaged in trade. In agricultural societies in Asia, Africa, Europe, North and South America, and in the classic Egyptian, Greek, and Roman empires around the Mediterranean, this trade increased, aided by energy-rich innovations like sailing ships. A slowly growing merchant class managed to buy goods in one place and sell them in another, and profit from the exchange. This merchant class was small in agricultural societies and empires, it was usually looked down upon and sometimes suppressed by the elite rulers. These rulers, however, often used the merchant services to get luxury goods from far off places and to borrow money, usually to finance wars. Markets like these today in Morocco, Mali, Mexico, and China were common for centuries in all agricultural civilizations. Markets where local farmers could bring their fruits, vegetables, and livestock and exchange them for locally produced cloth, leather belts, pottery, and metal pans, as well as musical instruments and religious relics and treasures. Merchants like the famous Marco Polo traveled what is called the Silk Road from Europe to the Middle East and China in medieval and Renaissance times taking wood and gold and silver from Italian city-states like Venice or Genoa and bringing back silk, beautiful ceramics, jewels, carpets, and rare spices in exchange. This was a kind of early merchant capitalism as each partner in the trade tried to get the best deal 
so that both would emerge winners. Muhammad himself, founder of the Islamic religion, was a merchant as well as a warrior. This early merchant capitalism, however, was never the basic life-supporting structure that kept the vast majority of people alive, nor did it greatly increase the net wealth of any society. The feudal world, of course, was not exactly the same everywhere. It was shaped and modified by the religion, by the technology, by the culture, and by the geography of a given society. Most historians today argue that the most important of the differences that led to modern capitalism and democracy came out of the often chaotic Christian world of Western Europe. In medieval times in Europe, for instance, unlike the more geographically far-reaching empires in China, Japan, and the rest of the world, there were literally thousands of feudal estates along with hundreds of small city-states, and all of them relatively independent of one another, and often at war with one another. While serfdom was still the rule in the Middle Ages, slavery, which was universal in the Islamic and many other societies at that time, was for the most part abolished in Europe by the late Middle Ages. That, along with a disaster known as the Black Plague, that killed a third of the population in Europe, left feudal estates and city-states with a severe shortage of workers. This shortage, in turn, was a stimulus to innovation. People had to find ways to get necessary work done with fewer workers, and they did. And the first steps were taken to move away from a static, zero-sum society. Sailing ships were improved, the compass, clocks, eyeglasses, water wheels were invented. Some think many of these innovations were first invented in China and slowly passed on to Europe over the Silk Road. In 1080, for instance, there were over 5,000 water wheels in Great Britain alone, used for grinding flour and sawing wood. Some of the few institutions that managed to sometimes escape the chaos of division, ignorance, and war were the monasteries that Christian orders established throughout Europe, the British Isles, and Scandinavia. Some of these monasteries became seedbeds for scientific and technological innovation, as well as an early kind of religious capitalism. Merchants and trade in agricultural kingdoms was limited mainly to luxury goods, and it did not envision or produce any great accumulation of capital for future profit. Few people even thought of the idea we call progress. Things just happened. Civilizations rose and fell. Good happened, bad happened. History, as well as economics, was zero sum. Monasteries in the European Middle Ages, on the other hand, began to experiment with new forms of economic organization that did emphasize investment for future profit. Motivated in part by their Christian faith, dreams of progress were in the air. Trade began to flourish as one monastery specialized in making wine, another in woolen goods, and still another in cheese making. And that was just the beginning. Monasteries developed some of the first banks, lending money to other monasteries, as well as to princes, kings, and the Pope. In England alone, there were over 500 banks in 1200, most of them branches of Italian banks. These banks also lent money at interest, even though such usury had traditionally been prohibited by Christian morality and law, as it still is in Islamic morality and law. And then, after the invention of the printing press in 1450 and the Protestant Reformation a few years later, literacy became more common in Europe than anywhere in the world. All of these trends eventually led to modern capitalism and democracy, and they were accelerated in the late Middle Ages and the Renaissance in northern Italy by merchant capitalists and bankers in new, fast-growing, prosperous city-states like Venice, Genoa, Pizza, and Milan. They were aided by new innovations in science and technology, 
like compasses, better sailing ships, better mathematics, and better maps and atlases. Then the center of this new kind of merchant capitalism moved a few decades later to Northern Europe and to the British Isles. Amsterdam and London became the vibrant centers of a rapidly expanding worldwide trade as sailing ships began to explore and expand trade and markets to all corners of the world. While the profits from this merchant capitalism, as well as imperialist ventures in Africa, Asia, and North and South America, soon made England and the Netherlands the richest countries in the world. But the real explosion of capitalism, industry, and science that is so dominant in our 21st century happened later, just a little over 200 years ago. And that story is the subject of part two of this program, Free Market Capitalism and Liberal Democracy.